Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, quarter past seven, as promised. Uh, we'll kick off this evening's webinar. Thank you for joining. Um, my name's Alastair Morris. If you've seen any communication regarding uh, Matt, Matt Craven, um, he and I share the webinar loads, and um, I'm using his sign on this evening, so um, I don't mind if you uh, call me Matt or Alastair, but um, it's me tonight. And um, we'll be spending... Um, hopefully uh, around about 50 minutes to an hour, depending on how things go, uh, discussing how to develop and pull together a high-impact interview-winning CV, specifically for the contract and interim market. Um, so um, just a few housekeeping things in terms of uh, communications this evening. Um, it's one-way audio, so I can't hear anything you say. I can't see you via a webcam. And uh, obviously you can't see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, please just use the question facility in the toolbar, presumably to the right of your screen, but wherever it's dumped itself. Um, ask any questions you like uh, within reason. And what I tend to do is towards the end of the session or at the end of the session, I'll deal with the um, as many questions as I can. Um, and for those that want to hang on and just listen to the answers, ir irrespective of whether you've asked a question or not, you're more than welcome to. Sometimes some people ask them really good, uh, relevant questions on, on material that uh, either I've not made clear enough or perhaps we've not covered in enough detail, um, and more than wel welcome to, uh, to listen on and, uh, and gain any knowledge you can. We're going to touch on, uh, although we talk about the CV a lot, we're also going to touch on LinkedIn this evening as well, towards the end of the uh, session. Um, it's increasingly important that if you've got to go to market with a reasonable CV, you ought to also be going to market um, and have a, a decent presence on LinkedIn. Um, and stands to reason if you've got an ineffective CV or one that underrepresents you and all you've done is dump that into LinkedIn, then um, though it's probably better to have a LinkedIn presence than none at all, it's not great if you've got a, a poor performing LinkedIn profile either. So we'll touch on some of the issues surrounding LinkedIn as well this evening. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's get cracking. Um, in terms of the um, uh, contract markets, particularly, that I'm going to be talking tonight about a couple of options you've got on the CV format, um, and this normally generates quite a few questions. Um, I'm going to have to talk in general terms, of course, you know, for the kind of situations that we encounter most of the time for most people. So it's averages of averages of averages. Um, if you've got any specific questions, yes, by all means, ask the question tonight. But if you've got anything that really needs a bit more of a detailed um, response, I'm more than happy to deal with it out of the webinar um, at some other time. And you can approach us via the website um, or uh, and the, the details of which you'll see on screen. Um, or just put a question in the uh, the pane this evening, and we can deal with it some other time if if it's a, if it's a detailed response you're after. So there are some detailed things that I just don't have the time to go into this evening, which may affect certain people in certain ways. But as I say, more than happy to deal with them in whichever way seems most appropriate. First of all, in terms of a little bit about who on earth we are. Uh, obviously, you've been invited via a Talent Spars uh, website to this evening's webinar. Um, I work for a business called the CV and Interview Advisors, and um, unsurprisingly, we're um, in the business of writing CVs and other career enhancement types of products like interview coaching and guidance. Um, the, one of the important messages you should take away from this evening, in fact, arguably the most important message, is that... Um, and I'll try and justify this through this evening's session, um, try and separate uh, the word CV and the phrase business case. Um, it, it's something we believe very strongly in that if you're going to write a good document, a document that's going to secure more interviews to more opportunities um, and ultimately contracts, possibly even leveraging your daily, hourly, monthly rate higher, then you need to be providing your audience with a business case as opposed to just what might people what some people might call a traditional CV. And so um, keep that firmly in view. And it's even more appropriate for contractors or people in interim work because, in effect, you're running micro businesses, whether you're operating through a limited business um, or an umbrella company or some other entity. 
in effect you're representing your offering to the world um, and therefore the document that you need to be sending out to your target audience needs to reflect that and you need to start thinking about it as a sales tool if you're not already. Um, so I will refer to the word CV but also um, uh, the fact that we are creating for our clients, the, the, the people that come to us for help with their CV, we're creating a business case as to why somebody should hire them, that's really important. In terms of the people that work for the CV and interview advisors, well, um, we're a bunch of uh, senior execs, recruitment experts, even published authors, strangely. Um, that's quite important, actually, in terms of just writing good content. Um, so if you're presenting a business case to your target audience, it does help if you can actually write well um, and extract raw data from people and then repackage it and represent it in a more effective way. So published authors tend to make pretty good CV writers. Um, my own background, just so you understand where I've come from, I have corporate background, then I moved into recruitment, um, then I moved into uh, working with um, Matt Craven who runs the business here at uh, CV and Interview Advisors, and so I've seen how CVs are used from all sorts of angles. I've hired people, um, recruited people, been a recruiter. Um, and actually then reviewed lots of CVs. So my role within the business is to review CVs, um, work with our partners like Talent Spa to advise them and provide uh, added value for their candidate base. Um, I also have written a few CVs as well. So I've seen it hopefully from a uh, sort of 360 degree view. Um, so we'll touch a bit on some of the findings on what makes uh, life a bit interesting when you're writing a CV later because it's good lessons for you to pick up on and, uh, and take forward. Um, one of the uh, so other important message lurking behind this evening, first one being treat your CV as a business case as to why somebody should hire you. Second one is know what the hot skills are in your market. Now, we, we because we write so many CVs, we're talking to lots of people in the marketplace, these things evolve. Hot skills, topical 10 years ago, maybe not so much now. Uh, conversely, stuff that's important now won't be so important in five years' time, maybe five months' time in some cases it's important you know what those hot skills are so that you can present the strongest business case to your market that you can. If you don't know what those hot skills are, find them out or seek help. Um, but, uh, but that's something that we do a lot of work on and helps contribute to build a stronger CV slash business case. Um, we've been used by people like Talent Spa and a few other folk besides as well to help provide advice. So. Um, Whilst that all sounds nice and glamorous from our point of view, the important thing behind that is that we're gaining lots and lots of insight in terms of what works in the marketplace, what doesn't work in the marketplace, what those hot skills are and how quickly they change. So we're like hoovering up lots of information from lots of sources to find out what works and what doesn't. Um, so whilst we couldn't claim to be um, the sole source of information by any means, um, it is important that we... Uh, that the, you understand that we do know what's going on in the marketplace. It's not just something that we've invented and thought was a good idea. And so the theories that we um, expound and communicate have some basis um, and traction in the market, more of which later. Now, as far as um, contractors are concerned, um, you'll probably all be aware in your time hunting for work, um, dealing with recruiters, employers, businesses, whatever, um, you come across certain challenges, particularly when you're trying to pull together your uh, your own CV or business case. For a lot of contractors we talk to, particularly those with um, double-digit year experience, one of the challenges is if you listed everything that you've done, you'd have a very long document. Um, I think the world record that I've seen um, at any one time in my life has been 33 pages, which is plainly ridiculous, but somebody thought that was quite a good idea to go to market with. Um, it isn't, just in case anybody's <laughs> thinking that that's a good idea. Um, it's a bit of an urban myth in terms of how long a CV should be, um, but typically for most contractors that we're working with, it's three or four pages. Um, and the, the key thing is, unless you're specifically asked or dictated to in terms of how long the document should be, there is no real right or wrong answer. What's far more important is the quality of the content within the document. So if you've got a one-page CV and it's full of rubbish, it's going to be no better 
um, than uh, any other length of document that's full of rubbish and it's certainly going to be no better than a good document that's two, three, four, five pages long. It's all about the content and the message. Um, page one is critical, um, we'll come on to that later, um, but whether a document should be absolutely fixed to a certain number of pages is a bit of an urban myth. What people tend to be far more bothered about is the quality of the content and does it fit their needs and expectations. And if it does, you'd be surprised how, um, how unimportant the length of the document becomes. Another challenge that um, contractors typically face is that recruiters who come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, bless them, um, would just make a judgment based on the last assignment that you've done or project that you've been involved with, simply because it's the one at the top of the page or top of the list of jobs that you've done and uh, contracts that you've had. Um, and to some degree, that's, I suppose you could understand it, it's frustrating, but it does happen and we recognise that it happens. Um, and going back to one of my earlier comments, it's part of the reason why we have a couple of different formats for contractors as far as the CV or business case is concerned. Um, again, more of that later. But if you've if you've suffered that same kind of problem where you're being judged primarily on what you last did, we've got some solutions to that coming up. Link to that, um, if you, particularly in the current climate, there's a fair few folk out there who've maybe been doing quite big roles in the past. Let's say they, argue for argument's sake, were program managers um, and have had to take project management roles, um, perceived maybe to be a, a slight step down because of the economic climate or taken any role that, that could arguably be slightly less than the, the, the area or, or level that they'd like to normally pitch for. Again, the challenge, particularly if they're recent assignments, is that if you go to market with a CV or document that presents them fairly high up the batting order, um, you might be harshly judged or pigeonholed by them. And If you've experienced that frustration, again, solutions around the corner. Um, also, this applies to all sorts of people, but again, particularly from contractors, uh, you might have a skill set that's well suited to a number of different positions or opportunities or environments. Um, a, a comment we uh, frequently get is, you know, I, I know that I can do different jobs. I might be a good project manager, but I might also be a good business analyst, for example. How can I appeal to those different audiences? Again. Um, that's something we're quite familiar with and we have a number of solutions to deal with. We're into the realms now of the yeah, bespoke kind of treatment um, and so these are the kind of issues that you know, need a lot of digging and uh, examining before we can give an absolute clear answer but I can tell you generically how we could handle some of these issues. Um, final comment about one of the challenges is that it, part of the battle some people face is actually understanding whether their CV is performing or not in the marketplace. Um, and how is it being judged and viewed, you'll find it really difficult to get good, honest feedback from anybody involved in the recruitment process as to how your CV has been interpreted. Um, and even if you've been given feedback, whether it's accurately the case, indeed whether it's actually true and the reason for why things happened or didn't happen for you um, is a mute point. So uh, our rule of thumb is the absolute acid test for any document that you're sending to your audience is uh, around this interview to application ratio. So if, if you've sent your CV to 10 opportunities and you're getting 10 interviews for those opportunities, there's not a lot of problem um, and there's not a lot we can do to help you. And so if that's the case, you should probably um, take time out now and go and enjoy your evening um, because life is good, happy days. If that used to happen for you, um, but doesn't anymore, um, stay on the line, as it were, because um, that's not an untypical experience by many contractors. In fact, lots of people out there who have, haven't have been able to exist without really having a formal CV and, and achieve things through word of mouth, which of course is great if you can make that work for you. But if you're in the realms of the zero, one, two, three interviews to every application that you're making, uh, 
you need to address something because it's the CV that's letting you down. Nothing to do with you personally. Most people won't know you from Adam. So if you're sending a document in any form to any other third party and they're interpreting it in such a way that doesn't result in an interview, um, take it as read that the message they're seeing is causing them a problem and it's certainly not compelling them to pick up the phone or email you or get you in front of them. So that's the absolute acid test. Now, you either have the the raw statistics to look at and observe and make a judgment on that. Um, most people don't have the luxury of time and opportunities to spend great swathes of time applying for lots of things and then figure out the maths. So don't spend too long contemplating those numbers if you don't already have them, but keep an eye on those stats. And that's the point at which you then need to decide whether you have to do anything or not. So if you're in the, the, yeah, the low hit rate, um, it's almost certainly the CV that's causing the problem. Um, the only other normal reasons are that people are doing a bit more digging into you and finding something that they don't like, and increasingly that could be a dodgy LinkedIn profile, um, arguably an even dodgier social networking profile, um, and, um, and, and other things that may be easily visible through search or um, investigation. For most people, the problem is the CV. Um, and how it's being interpreted, and, and, and it's at that early stage in the application process that you're getting filtered out, and people won't be doing any more digging into you. They'll just look at the CV, make a quick snap decision, yay or nay, and you've typically got five to 20 seconds of somebody's time in that initial part of the recruitment process for somebody to decide whether you're worth any further attention or not. It is that brutal. Um, very rarely are you going to get somebody in the early stages giving you a big, long consideration of your uh, application and interest in their opportunity. Um, it's not until much further down the process will somebody maybe relax with a cup of coffee um, and read your document in any more detail and then maybe start looking into your um, um, LinkedIn profile or other collateral. So that initial stage, keep an eye on those stats. If you've got a problem, if you know the results are looking bad, take that as your guide to do something and then you have to decide, do I do something myself um, and you'll have enough information this evening to be able to take some action or do I seek professional help um, and um, a bit more on that later. But that's the absolute key measure. So I'm sorry to have laboured that point but for quite a few people it takes a long, long time for them to realise that CV is the problem, that what they blame is the economic situation, lack of opportunities, that's fine. If you've got nothing to apply for, then there's nothing to apply for. But if there's any one opportunity and you're well suited to it and you apply for it and you don't get any interest, take it as read that the only reason why that's happened is that you know, somebody's not like what they've seen in front of them. For whatever reason, getting at that reason is quite hard. Um, second to that, a bit of an intermediary. So if you know you've got a problem, um, as I say, you can take action directly to sort the problem if you know what to do um, or from this evening and other endeavours you know what to do. You could seek professional help intermediary stages to get us to take a look at it or any, anybody else who uh, knows what they're doing. Take a look at the document, explain to us or them what you're up to um, and then pretty much we can make a, a quick quick and clear decision and say look, you know, it, the reasons why it's not working are X, Y and Z and then you can choose to do whatever you want to do thereafter. Um, I spend a good chunk of my life reviewing CVs, so it's certainly something I don't mind spending a bit of time on if, you, if you're unsure as terms of how people might be interpreting your, uh, your documents. Okay, so there's some of the challenges. How do, we, um, how do we deal with those challenges? Well, as I said earlier, and I've made a couple of references to, um, there are two ways we go about constructing a CV. Um, for want of a better word, I'm going to describe one tonight as a chronological CV um, with a tweak, as you'll see, um, and then one that aimed very much towards the contract and interim market. The chronological CV, and I'll show you some examples of these shortly as well, I should hasten to add, um, ideal for people relatively new to the contract market, maybe you started off in permanent career and only recently gone into contract market. It caters for the relationships with recruiters where the recruiters don't really understand the contract market. If that is, uh, you, you'll know whether this is true of you or not. Um, 
for most contractors, you have to deal with both people that understand it and don't understand it. So you have, have to take a bit of a weighted view on this. There are plenty of recruiters out there who will still see contractors as glorified temps. Um, why? God only knows, but they do. Um, so if you know your marketplace is saturated with those kind of people and that you're having a struggle to explain why you've done quite a few different things in a relatively short period of time or why there are gaps in your career um, and people are questioning you about that, then you might want to consider the chronological style of CV that we'll look at in detail later as being the way to go if you were restructuring your CV. Um, it also works well where you're dealing with, um, I suppose, you know, the Michael Pages reads of this world where there's you know, lots of transactions going on or where the employer is a big employer of contractors and they, and that happens particularly within IT and finance, I guess, where they're really just looking for candidates um, and they just want to hoover in huge amounts of raw data. They make a very quick snapshot decision. Um, and then and then get people into interviews. So if you know it is that high volume, high transactional rate of recruitment going on, either through the recruiter or through the employer directly, again, it tends to point towards the chronological kind of CV style as being a better approach. Um, and what do I mean by chronological CV? Well, I guess it will appear to most people as being a traditional style in that it, it, it would suggest and map out what you've been doing in a classical chronological order. And so we'll look at an example in a minute. But one of the things that we do, the tweak bit, if you like, to this, is that before you start talking about where you've been, what you've been doing with the last contract or the current contract, you draw out certain evidence of your ability to perform a role before that. Um, and that's, that's the tweak. Most people open up too quickly with what they've got to offer and they assume that whoever they're working for or, or have most recently worked for coupled with some kind of brief introduction to what they're about which is normally wide of the mark um, and talks about the wrong kind of things and, and, and they assume that that's enough to get the message across and that people will assume all the things that they want them to assume um, I'm afraid that tends not to be the case so our approach is before you start telling people where you've been working and the dates um, surrounding that, draw out the key competences that you have that would the target audience would be expecting to see, the things that really fit you well to that job, um, contract or whatever. Um, again, I'll show you an example very shortly. Again, going back to this business case example. Um, the, the style of CV that we would label as the chronological style, it harnesses the power of, of a very strong first page, which is absolutely critical. If you've got five to 20 seconds of somebody's time, in effect, they're going to be able to read about half the first page of whatever you've sent them before making a decision. Um, and it's unlikely they'll get much further than that before they've made some kind of initial decision, particularly if there are a high volume of applicants for a particular role or opportunity. So whilst there are exceptions to every rule, do not assume that people give, and you probably know this already either or have uh, feared it maybe, do not assume that you get that luxury of time and for somebody to consider your well-crafted document for more than a few seconds. If it's not positioned well and if that first page is not well positioned, you could lose the opportunity to be involved in the process for very much longer um, and then that's it, game over. What our job is to do is to advise people or to provide the support to develop a, a compelling first page and particularly the top half of the first page to make sure that people feel um, engaged that you are the right person or at least um, a valid applicant for the role and that you would appear to possess the skills required for the role um, and that the encouragement should be for them to read on or to put you in the maybe pile or the yes pile um, but certainly not to put you in the no pile. So this opening style of CV, the chronological style of CV, will deal with all of those things but it's particularly well suited to people who, as I say, are fairly new to the contract market or are dealing with people who don't understand the contract market. It presents them with a slightly more traditional option. Um, I'm going to show you now an example of what I mean by that. 
um, on the screen, or, or rather the left-hand side of the screen, so you uh, see it. I'm just wait for everybody to get the visibility of that. My little tool tells me whether everybody can see it or not. This is one person there having to wait to see it. So anyway, on the left-hand side of the screen, um, you should see headed Matt Craven, because that's whose CV it is. What I would describe as being a chronological, traditional CV, um, as written by ourselves. Now, I'll explain later some of their content. Um, but what I wanted to try and get across to you, first off, is the style of CV, because it differs quite significantly from our more contract-focused CV which I'll come on to shortly. So you'll see, um, interestingly, three main sections that I want to uh, just highlight at the moment. Um, top executive summary, uh, sometimes called professional summary. doesn't really matter what you call it within reason. Uh, it's the content that matters. Come back to that later. Then some bullet points. Come back to those later. The bit I really wanted to just for you to look at is the relationship between the career highlights and what I've just mentioned, and then right at the bottom of the screen you'll notice career history, which is where we're talking about what Matt's been up to, his most recent employer, current employer, um, and, um, and you'll notice that that's quite a way down page one, deliberately so. So what are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to build a business case, and the business case is not supported by hitting people between the eyes as to who Matt's currently working for. That's not his strongest. Um, criteria or um, tool, if you like. Um, what he's trying to say on his CV, um, whether it's relevant or not at this stage, doesn't really matter. But it's, um, let's imagine it's relevant to whoever we're reading it in the real life. He's trying to describe, uh, in effect, a bit about himself, key areas of expertise that he possesses, and then the important bit, these career highlights, right in the middle of the CV, the three paragraph bullets, career highlights. There. Um, case study evidence of where he's been able to demonstrate the skills he's just said that he has, which is where people might get, get their CV hideously wrong. They tend to talk about things that aren't relevant and worse still, don't go on to actually prove their ability to deliver on those skills. So if you've chosen the wrong skills, remember I talked about hot skills in the marketplace, if you choose the wrong skills to feature on your CV, and then you don't go on to prove whether you've got a competence in them, you sort of got a double whammy in a massive negative sense, um, such a thing can exist. Um, so an ideal CV, a good strong business case is, here are a set of skills and abilities that I have, I know as, as an applicant that they're relevant to your marketplace, and here's the proof to back them up. That's a strong business case. A weak CV is just a list of things that somebody's done, um, and, and that's the difference between a strong CV, business case, and a weak one. Uh, most people, not everybody, but most people tend to go market with a list of things that they've done, hoping that the reader of their CV will, as if by magic, understand the relevance of that list, its appropriateness, its strength, its value, and, and I'm afraid it just doesn't happen. Most people who look at CVs to start with aren't the best person to make a strong, qualified judgment on your relevance as an individual for an opportunity. Um, that's just because that's not their job. What they've been asked to look for is certain characteristics or qualities. Um, and if you don't make it abundantly clear that you've got those qualities, um, you'll lose the, the fight at that moment in time. If your CV does get passed on to somebody who's got a more um, vested interest in the process and able to make a good judgment about you, you need to be able to back up the claims that you've made to get you that far in the first place. Um, so if somebody's picked up on the fact that you're good at certain things, technical skills, functional skills, whatever they may be, if you've not then gone on to prove them, at that second stage you'll probably lose out um, because the person, the hiring manager making the decision may think, well, yeah, there's all these wonderful claims but there's no proof. Matt CV, um, in this, what we would call a traditional format, um, is basically saying, is the proof to back up what I'm good at before talking about who he's worked for. That's the critical thing. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Um, and so um, let us move on to um, some of the other things that we get up to, the alternative solution. So um, you noticed on those career highlights on the CV that I just showed you, 
uh, three examples. We're going we're to look at um, how you structure those examples shortly. Um, but if we were to provide an alternative solution, which we have done to many contractors and interim workers uh, in recent years, the bit that we beef up would be dramatic uh, increase in the number of uh, those case studies and career highlights. So they'd be the focus of the document rather than any chronological order of things. It's not to say the chronological order wouldn't appear, which we'll see in a short while, but it's actually then saying, well, hang on a minute, what are you most likely to be hired for? who's making the decisions, and assuming that you're talking with people who understand the contract market, either as employers or recruiters, the, uh, the important um, factors here is your the proof to back up why you could literally descend upon somebody tomorrow morning and perform a role. Um, and the real way of communicating that to your audience is through case studies. Um, and we describe it as being case study portfolio or framework, which is basically a a wide selection of examples of the work that we've done, rather than just a list of responsibilities and duties. The beauty of going to market with a document that lists the case studies, um, rather than focusing on trying to stay within the chronological order of things, is you can then reorder the contracts and project experience that you have, depending on your target audience. So if you had the ability to wear a project management hat um, and a BA hat, business analyst hat, depending, you could reorder the case studies you present to your target audience accordingly um, and vary it very easily. It then suddenly makes your document far more modular and customizable, which will get around a lot of problems. The current climate, most people are risk averse. They're lucky. They wanted to recruit like for like. So if they've got in their mind a role, chances are they'll want to recruit somebody into a role who um, is pretty much doing the same thing for a competitor um, or somebody in the industry at a similar level um, and they were doing it sort of yesterday to exaggerate slightly. Um, so providing you with a, a way of being able to shuffle the packet in other words so your your cards are your case studies um, and whereas a traditional CV forces you to lay out the cards in a prescribed order, i.e. chronological order, if you're able to strip away that constraint, all of a sudden you've got a far more flexible document and you can go to market promoting the things that you're good at and that are most relevant to your next intended contract or piece of work. Um, and that's, that's our alternative solution. Again, I'll show you an example in a bit. Each of the case studies that we write is written in a consistent format. By that I mean that the size, the shape, the wording um, is, is um, uh, following a particular tool, which again I'll show you in a minute. Um, and the key thing here is it's providing powerful evidence as to why you could perform a certain role. So a lot of people just describe fairly aimlessly what they've been up to. So they'll say, I was in a such a project with such and such an employer between these dates doing this or respond, were still responsible for this, that and the other. And, and I'm afraid that it just makes you look like a me too kind of a person. It's not enough. You have to be able to prove how you could offer a return on the investment somebody's going to make in you. And these case studies give you a really good way of being able to deal with that. So um, I'll give you a brief look um, at the style of CV that I've referred to, um, sort of a more contract-based one. And um, we'll take a look at the document itself. So appearing on your screen now, and I'll just show it in, in all its glory, is Matt's CV, and there, most of you should have that full screen now. So here we've got Matt's CV again, but this is what we'd call our contract style CV, for want of a better word. Um, and you'll notice some subtle differences. The actual uh, summary and bullet point of expertise are exactly the same, or could be exactly the same, so that's that remains very similar because they're setting the scene as we'll come on to in a bit but you'll notice now a difference rather than a box marked career highlights where there were three bullets um, three bulleted paragraphs giving the audience a flavor of math skills what he's doing here is actually saying okay my role at the moment is a as a freelance contractor slash interim manager let's imagine he's operating through um, his own limited business CVIA limited so he's just twisting around. Obviously, he's a director of his own business, um, 
but he's not a freelance in the great scheme of things, but if he were presenting himself as that, this is how it would look. So he's describing to his audience, yeah, this is what I am. Um, this is the business entity that I'm operating through. So again, it's sort of implying that you're dealing with people who understand the market. Um, you know, there's a lot of recruiters out there who can't grasp why you're running a limited business. Um, and um, that, whilst that's unfortunate, it, it is the case. But if you're dealing with people who understand why you're running a limited business or operating under an umbrella company or some other entity, um, and they're comfortable with that, and the people on the deciding uh, side of the table, the employers are comfortable with that and they understand that, this format works really well because in effect you're saying, yep, that's what I am, here's the area of skills that I have. And then before you start talking about anything to do with where you've been most recently, what Matt's done here is he's presenting a list of assignments or projects in no particular order, and they're not necessarily everything he's done, but they're the most relevant things that he's done for his target audience or for the direction in which Matt wants to head. So he's picked out here a number of things. They've got a little descriptor in terms of who was the company, what was the subject matter, and what was his role, and how long did it last for. And then he's describing in a way that I'll, um, I'll show you how we construct this, exactly the background to that particular project or assignment and what happened. Okay, and he's then replicating that um, for a number of projects or assignments um, throughout the CV and typically and you'll see just the bottom of the CV appear on the screen now so page one's got three on but then page two would follow with another probably four or five just to give people a selection and so it's a slightly different approach to the CV it worked really well for those people who are operating in a well-established contract or interim environment because it provides your target audience with the information they're craving for proof of. It's in effect saying, this, I've set the scene, I've told you what I am, and here's the proof. I have delivered in these areas for these companies doing such and such roles across such and such a period of time. And we'll come on later to how we do with the chronological bit. But I just wanted to show you the difference in um, style of um, which one you go with is entirely up to you. Um, if you use our services, we can help you with that. You can to be honest, there's plenty of folk out there who've gone to market with both and they use one style for certain people and one style for another type of audience. Um, but, but in the main, you could choose one and you'll know whether it works or not. Um, and uh, as I say, that's something we can help with at a later stage. So in terms of the structure of the document, just briefly going through some of the key things, um, you'll have noticed at the top of Matt's CVs, in both cases, we had executive summary. As I said, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Sometimes we call it a professional summary. Sometimes we call it an executive summary. But very simply, if you're not doing these things, then again, you're not helping your cause. So the very first thing you need to be doing is describing what you are. It sounds so obvious, but you'd be surprised, and you'll know if you're doing this or not, how many people fail to say what they actually, what they actually are crudely, and there are always exceptions to every rule. If you're a project manager, you say you are a project manager or an experienced project manager or a business analyst uh, or an interim HR manager reflect what your target audience is looking for in the very first opening sentence of your CV slash business case so that people are aware that you are a valid applicant for the role. Again, if you don't make that clear, you're already at the risk of being discounted purely because the reader is thinking, what is this person? Are they similar to the person I've just rejected who didn't make it clear what they were and when I actually got anywhere close to finding out what they were, I found out they were actually making widgets in a factory in um, you know, the wrong part of the country or even the wrong country and they might not even have been eligible to work in wherever they needed to work. So there are, you'd be surprised how many applicants who are completely inappropriate for the role will apply for the role, even at senior levels. Um, the, you might think, well, they'll get weeded out. Um, and, and you're probably right, they will get weeded out. The trouble is, if the recruiter gets a bit trigger happy, 
um, and they're reviewing CVs and they're taking that five to 20 seconds to make a judgment, what you don't want to do is get assumed or pigeonholed as being a time waster or invalid applicant purely because your professional summary, your personal profile, whatever you've called it, is completely irrelevant to their needs. So describe what you are. Really important next bit. What is your, and it's a horrible cliche, but I'm afraid it's the best way of describing it. What is your value proposition? So in effect, and I'll show you an example in a bit. Um, if you're pitching yourself for a 250, 350, 500 quid a day, whatever kind of rate it is, per hour, whatever, um, you've got to be able to provide some kind of return on that investment. So however hidden it may be, at some point in time, somebody's going to be making that decision. Um, so make it clear to your target audience, what are you offering in return for the investment they're about to make in you? What skills do you have? What can you help fix for them? What can you help deliver? That overriding proposition needs to be communicated. And then, coming back to these hot skills, you need to be reflecting a handful of um, appropriate skills that you have experience of. That could be sector experience, it could be uh, techno technological experience, it could be certain um, ex experience of a certain customer, client, environment, but, but there'll be something there that you need to reflect and that you'll have an ability, make it clear that you're communicating that ability. And above all, Avoid talking about anything that can't be proven on the CV. And the classics where most people get it hideously wrong is mentioning things that are behavioral or cliche personality traits. So if you've got any mention of interpersonal skills, enthusiasm, dedication, commitment, passion, uh, anything like that, whilst they're admirable skills in their own right, they are completely useless to mention on your CV because they can't, you can't prove them um, on the CV. Um, um, you'll have a job proving them to satisfaction at interview in a lot of cases and in reality people won't be able to judge whether you've got some of those things before you've actually worked for a business uh, or within a business for a period of time. So as far as the interview is concerned, getting the interview or progressing your application or interest and actually um, getting um, some result out of your CV is wholly inappropriate to talk about those kind of things, so get rid of them and replace them with functional, factual, hard-hitting evidence. So big warning sign, if you've got any of those kind of traits on your CV, get rid of them because they're not helping you. Most people mention them because most people think that's what you need to do and they've seen them on other people's CVs, but if you watch a recruiter or a hirer, they just glaze over, um, skip to the next bit and then you've probably lost them at that moment in time. Good way of thinking about things is if, you, if you're mentioning anything in that opening statement, um, think if you've ever had any training on features and benefits, um, a, a bit like um, most marketing material really, if it's well written, think about if you've got something that you're proud of and it is a, a feature so that you, you understand a particular technology, for example, what's the benefit to the reader of that or the employer or the hiring manager of that particular feature? So it's a bit like uh, if you've ever written a, a, read any um, like car brochures, for example, or, or, or online material. Um, you know, if somebody says this car's got uh, ABS, anti-lock brakes, that's a feature. What's its benefit? It makes the car safer. You've got to think of yourself a bit like that. You, if you know a particular um, IT system, um, operational system, customer relationship, um, sector knowledge, it's not just enough to say that you've got it, what's the benefit of having that experience? Thereby, you're starting to scratch away at the value proposition you have to offer the market. Um, you have to be that detailed, I'm afraid, to make a difference and differentiate yourself. So that's how you structure the professional summary or the, the elements that you need to consider to be able to build a strong professional summary. So you can already think, we've talked to now about this for a good five minutes or so, um, it's not the work of a moment. It needs some deep thought, and you need to position it well into the marketplace. If you don't understand what's working in the marketplace and what's exciting people and what they're looking for, um, you'll start to deviate from the path straight away and lose people's attention. 
let's take a look at an example um, of a finance person, as it turns out. Um, it doesn't matter what level you're at, what roles you have, what you've done in the past, what you want to do in the future. Everybody can construct an opening statement that fits the criteria I've just talked about. Um, so read this example at your leisure. Um, the important things are, just to reflect on what I've, I've, I've explained, the first sentence is the, what is this person, what are they? Uh, the, the middle chunk is the value proposition and hot skills, and interspersed amongst that is a bit about how that would offer some return for the employer. So in a nutshell, because I'm not going to read it all through, you can see it yourself, senior finance person, it's making it clear the level that this person is at, um, it's making clear where the value add could be, protecting cash flow profitability. That's the core proposition. The hot skills, we have to assume, because obviously we don't know what they are for this particular person, but let's assume they are the, the bit in the middle, the key strengths include bit, they're the hot skills. Um, and in effect, they're suggesting pretty clearly um, that they could handle a fairly senior financial role and that the benefits would accrue, or benefits would accrue as a consequence of employing this individual in whatever capacity. Okay, so this is very bespoke, it differs for everybody, there are some commonalities, if there are any senior finance people out there this evening, then it will make sense, but you can write, uh, and, it, and you could use elements of this in your own CV, um, but as I say, everybody can write one of these, everybody's got enough material, it's just figuring out what's important and what isn't, both from your own toolkit of skills, but also what the market's expecting to see. Okay. Um, you'll remember also uh, from the two CVs that I showed you, Matt's CVs, that underneath the opening paragraph, the professional or executive summary, the next thing was a series of bullet points. Um, now these are important for two main reasons. Aesthetically, they help break up the document um, and also provide people who are skimming your CV with evidence of certain brief skills, qualifications, accreditations that might be important to the application process. Um, so that's, that's the first reason. Second reason is, of course, um, as far as the electronic processing is concerned, if you get the key skills right, they're very useful for populating database technologies, search engine optimization, bits and pieces, and all those other, other wonderful things that go on with your document electronically once you've submitted it to any form of storage. So um, they're really important because they help build your business case. Um, for those that are skim reading your CV and giving you that five to 20 odd seconds, it's, a, it's a, an area to be able to just quickly think, yeah, this person's got things that I, I've been asked to look out for that are making me feel comfortable about this individual that I need to find in the individual we decide to appoint. Um, so it's important to get this area right but you can also change these and it gives you some modularity and customization to the CV um, because they're dead easy to, to amend. Now here are just a few examples. Um, you'll notice that in the main there are two, three, possibly four words and no more. So they don't go onto a se separate or second line. Um, they're not sentences, they are active in the sense of um, fairly short, sharp, summaries of things that you might have as a skill set. If you're a project manager and you've got PRINCE2 qualifications, that would be a classic one that's going on here. If you've got multilingual abilities, that would go on here. If you've got ISEB testing abilities and you're a software tester, that would go on here. Um, trying to think of some really uh, other big popular ones. Um, I suppose if you're in finance, you could mention Sage, VAT, HMRC involvement, things like that. Um, again, you need to know what the hot skills are, but this is a good area to reflect the skills that the very employer or recruiters are asking for, as long as you can back them up with proof. Of course, you can't just list out anything um, if it's not substantial, but if you can substantiate it, then it's a great area to make sure you've got a good balance of skills. Numbers wise, somewhere between 5 and 14, so that's 5 to 7 on the left hand side, 5 to 7 on the right hand side, that's about as far as you'd want to go. Um, you don't want it to appear as half a page of things because it, 
it just is overwhelming. So you've got to get the balance right and pick the ones that are most relevant. Okay, so that's the key sales section. Um, now, just uh, to hang that all together again, we'll just take a quick look at um, Matt EV, which I showed you earlier. Uh, do, 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 do. Here we go. I'll put it on the screen again for you all. So uh, we talked about the opening summary statement. You can see the bullet points there on um, Matt's CV. Um, that we call them expertise there, but it could be key skills. Again, it just depends a little bit on the, the position of the document, but it's the content that matters rather than the title. Um, and then you'll see an area, bearing in mind this is the contract style CV that we're talking about, um, entitled current role. Um, and that's important really because it's just stating right now what is this person doing, um, what are they occupying within the marketplace, um, and a little bit of information that those, and we should call them savvy recruiters, but the recruiters that understand the contract market, they can just see that you're, yeah, you're live, you're up and running, um, and you can operate within a certain entity. And, and for a lot of employers, you know, that the nature of how you're operating is important. It is a, it is, you know, it's important that you possibly got your own limited business, um, or at least operating within those kind of confines um, that you may have the appropriate, or it's assumed that you've got the appropriate legal status, protection, um, possibly implied insurance. Um, but it just, you know, for those that know the market, it's important. So all you're doing is providing a bit of background. Um, it could be appropriate if you've worked for um, well-known organizations to mention them in that area. In some cases, it's actually worth mentioning that in the professional summary or the opening statement that we just spent some time talking about. Um, there are certain employers or sectors that are worth using as marketing collateral. So mention them. You'd be surprised how many people would be recruited if only it was clearer that they'd been involved in a certain sector or operators within that sector. Um, individuals tend to take that all for granted. They either assume that people must know that already, or they perhaps undervalue the importance of who they've worked for, um, or just assume that because it's buried in the CV somewhere that somebody will magically find it. Um, as I suggested a number of times now, if you've got five to 20 odd seconds for somebody to make that initial decision about your application or interest, um, then they're not going to see everything. So make the really important stuff shine um, and, and, and shout out. Um, the whole purpose of this little box marked current role is to introduce the next section. Um, so in effect, to give you an example, um, Here's be an area to put, yes, okay, from such and such a date to such and such a date, you have been a freelancer, contractor. If you want to call yourself a, by title, what you've been doing most often, if it was a project manager, business analyst, um, HR person, whatever it may be, you could describe yourself as that. That's fairly flexible how you're describing yourself. But um, as, a, as a broad example, this is how you'd explain what you've been up to. So you could say, yes, since whatever year you've operated as a professional contractor or as a freelance contractor or whatever, um, completing assignments for high profile companies such as HP, Barclays, NatWest, whatever, RBS, um, whoever it may be, Shell, BP. And then importantly, below is a list, I below on the on the C V below is a list of example assignments completed over this period as well as major projects from a permanent career, if that were relevant, of course. If you've not ever done a permanent career or it's so far back in the past, it's, it's immaterial, we wouldn't mention that. But for a lot of people, they've had a combination of employment status. Um, and so it's worth mentioning that you've picked out a series of examples from that period of time. And that what follows is in no particular order and not all are listed. Now, this is, this is quite important because what it's suggesting is for those that understand the contract market, you've cherry-picked some examples to show them. Most people get that. They understand it. Those people, and it typically is the recruiters or junior hiring folk, um, HR people that don't understand the contract market, when they then see this next section, what they expect in their mind to see is the chronological order of things. 
um, which is not what we're presenting. What we're presenting is a series of projects that are highly relevant to the target audience in any order that we've cared to choose. Um, so you're dictating the order, not necessarily time stamping them in any way. You're just cherry picking a number of things that you've done that are relevant to your future direction, uh, relevant to the target audience, um, as examples of what you've got to offer the world. Now, if your marketplace, the people you're working with can buy that and understand it, it works really well. And there's lots of evidence to suggest it actually makes a big, big difference to people's success rate. But if you're in a marketplace that doesn't like that and they look at the document and think, well, um, I, don't, I don't quite understand why it's laid out like this and why is it not in a nice logical chronological order, then this is where things don't work out so well and you need to go to a more traditional structure of CV. So this, this, this requires some more time and attention and thought if you're interested in it. But as I say, some, some uh, contractors will go with both styles and, and choose which to send to who. So it's a nice introduction. It explains what you're doing, the background to what you've got experience in, some of the people you might have worked for and had experience within, and then it's suggesting, right, the next bit of my document is examples of what I've done, which you should find interesting. And moving on to that very area then, um, of course, if you're going to pick out examples, they need to be um, relevant and impressive. And that's in the sense of trying to imagine what your target audience is looking for. So not the ones that you think were best, but actually have less or even no relevance to the marketplace. So again, most CVs that I tend to review, if, they were, if I were to criticize them, where people have picked examples, they've picked the wrong examples because they've chosen to focus on things they thought were important or they found interesting or exciting. But actually, if you were to quiz your target audience, they would not take as much um, credence from. Um, and so you need to give these things a little bit of thought. Focus on the ones that tell the best story for your target audience, not for you and your ego, <laughs> um, I guess. That's important. The other important thing is that these case studies that describe, um, and again, I'll come back to the examples later, um, the, the um, case studies are focusing on projects, assignments, or experiences, not chunks of employment, periods of employment. So then we're not defining them in chronological order or indeed by running from period A to period B, i.e. June 2013 to September 2013. We're not saying that at this moment in time. All we're doing is picking out examples of work. So if you've been working for a particular company for, let's say, 24 months, but within there you've done three massive projects or pieces of work, each one of those pieces of work could be a separate case study if it helped build your business case. So hopefully now you can see you can build up a far more effective document because you're focusing on things you've actually done, not just about the chronological order, not just about the time period, and then you feel compelled to briefly mention things or to not mention things because there's not enough space. It's a slightly different approach. But as I say, it can and has proven to be really effective for those people who are operating in the right part of the market. Again, we'll look at some examples. We follow a methodology to build up this case study. So I said that we followed a you know, kind of formula to um, arrive at uh, a little descriptor for how you put together these experiences, project assignments that you've had. Um, it's not um, our invention. STAR exists in all sorts of walks of life and stands for situation, task, action, and results. Um, and it's a great way of building up a concise story about something that's happened in your life, um, but also a great way of dealing with interview questions where people are looking for examples or proof to back something up. I'm going to show you an example now. This is off Matt's CV, so when we go back and have a look at his CVs on both styles, he's got a particular case study or career highlight, which is entitled this. Um, ERAC stands for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, just so you know, that's not that important, but that's what it means. Um, and so um, in this particular example, he's describing a business transformation project 
that he was involved with where he was the interim operations manager, um, a project which took six months. There's the text. Now, um, to try and break that down, the first sentence, again, you can read that for yourselves. Um, just waiting, there's one person still not got this on their screen by the looks of it, but I'll, um, I'll just read through briefly the sections. So, uh, right, everybody's got it now. So the, the, the first sentence is the situation. Um, so let's imagine for a moment, this thing took six months. Matt could probably have written a book on it if he'd wanted to, I'm sure, or a, a small paperback anyway. But for the purposes of CV, building his business case for his target audience, he can't take up that much real estate. He's got to get across in a few seconds a message about his competence to do something of use. And this particular case, the situation was that Enterprise Rent-A-Car acquired an unprofitable competitor in the south of England that required transformation. Dead simple. Okay, you don't need the detail. You don't need the, to explain great swathes of information. It's just a very quick summary of what on earth was going on in the first place, the situation. The task is the responsibility on Matt's shoulder to do something and how he fit into this. Um, so in this particular case, appointed interim operations manager, blah de blah de blah de blah. Um, that sentence is the task. The bulk of the rest of the paragraph are the actions. So he did a number of things as interim operations manager to move things forward, to progress things. Performed a review of the business, exited underperforming staff, again, blah de blah de blah. And then the last sentence is the result. Succeeded in rebranding the business, turning a such and such a loss into such and such a profit within such and such a time frame, in this case six months. So, as I say, he could have written a book on it, it took him six months to do, he's managed to compact that into a modest paragraph, which on page um, is, a, is, is a, about six lines deep uh, of a modest page where it's entirely digestible, and that's the important thing. People tend to either go way too light, um, so many people would say just the first sentence, um, you know, in this case, Iraq acquired an unprofitable competitor south of England that required transformation, and I sorted it, or I turned it around, or I was responsible for doing it, but with no clear indication of whether it was actually achieved or not, or the other end of the extreme, write half a page on something, which people are just not going to read, not to decide whether you get an interview or not. So you've got to get the balance right, and the balance is about this size of text, and, and it's been proven time and time again. If you go to, if you try and trim this any further, you miss stuff out, it, it becomes almost meaningless. If you add to it too much, people just glaze over again. They're not interested in looking at so much detail. Always remember that the CV's job is to get you to the next stage of the process. It is not the um, be-all and end-all to everything, in most cases anyway. So all you're trying to do is, is to suggest to whoever's going to make the decision that you would be worth taking a stage further, be that a telephone call, Skype session, a video conference, a meeting, an email, whatever it may be, it's just to get you to the next part of the process, at which point people will have probably a whole host of questions or issues to deal with, or maybe they won't, but it gets you to the next stage. So you have to get that balance right. Providing people with war and peace descriptions on what you've been up to is not the solution. Conversely, trying to condense things into the minimum amount of space also doesn't help. So you've got to get that balance right. This gets the balance right. Um, it's great, as I hinted at earlier, if you're in an interview situation, somebody said, right, give us an example of when you've transformed business. This amount of text translates into a good, productive, concise answer to that question. If you were to read that out to somebody off the top of your head um, or something like it, it's about what people can tolerate. You know, you're, you can maintain a flow. It sounds punchy, concise, meaningful. Um, people won't be sort of nodding off as you spend hours trying to answer the question. It's a really good way of deconstructing complex events and then repackaging them effectively. And so that's what we do. And we'd repeat that a number of times, as I've shown you, on the CV to get the message across. But they have to be relevant examples. If you just pick random things, it looks awful on the CV. Um, and, and again, will lose you rather than gain you interest. 
Okay, um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, bit of a popcorn break now, whilst um, people just gather their thoughts. Um, uh, and a reminder that if you've got any questions, um, just tap away in the question box um, somewhere in the taskbar that you've got for GoToWebinar, um, and I'll deal with them at the end of the session. Um, and uh, what tends to happen is that most people then start to say, okay, well, yeah, what do you do? What do you get up to? So very briefly, um, it's not so much of a popcorn break from my side because I'm still talking, but um, briefly, what do we do and, and where do we uh, help people? Well, it won't surprise you to know that our business is writing CVs, developing business cases that basically get people more interviews at the bottom of it. And if you were to go down that path, as I suggested to you um, right at the beginning of the session, you know, the very first thing you have to assess is, is the document that you currently have getting you the results that you want? If it is, don't worry, you know, keep, keep on plodding away. If it isn't, then you have to decide what action to take. And the action is either you fix it, measure the success or otherwise, and then review and refine appropriately or get professional help. Lots of people out there can help. Um, obviously, we'd rather you consider us than anybody else, but it's a free world. Um, but if you were to work with us, you basically get to work with a senior level professional, somebody who understands the market. They work with you to help define what that value proposition is. You may know parts of it, you may not. We can help you with that and how you take that to market. Work out what those skills are that you have talk through, extract from you in the nicest possible way the raw data to support the case studies we'd need to write. So you saw the example with Matt and his enterprise rent-a-car example. Everybody's got those kind of things lurk, lurking away in their inventory of life. Um, it's our job to extract from those, from you, those experiences. Um, for contract CV, as I suggested earlier, we'd look to be putting up to eight. Somewhere between six and eight is a good number. Anything less than that doesn't work. More than eight takes the document length up a bit. Um, what people that have used our services have tended to do is start with eight, but then over time build up more, either because they write them themselves or they come back to us and, and we write them for them. And they have a portfolio. And then they can choose from maybe 15, 20, 30 case studies um, and pick the ones that are most relevant to whoever they're sending their document to at that moment in time. So it's a really good way of building up a modular CV. Um, we we can we can provide the advice you're very rarely going to get from most of the people. I mean, strange, employers very rarely will give you any insight into your CV. Recruiters, a uh, varied bunch of feedback from our experience, um, but it's important that somebody gives you a bit of a sanity check on you know what have you got to offer the world and how can you explain that and we can help you with that. And self-evidently, if we're writing a CV, we start from scratch. You'll have gathered now that the format, the structure of the document, the style of it is completely different. Um, yeah, if you were thinking of taking lessons learned from this evening forward, you'd have to pretty much start from scratch anyway. It's very hard to amend something that's already existing. Um, and so that's our philosophy as well. We don't amend CVs. We don't tweak CVs. We don't look at them and tweak them a little bit and that will magically make things better. They very rarely will. It's a complete root and branch revisit of everything and we have to build a business case and that, that takes time and effort. Bottom line is therefore we can maximize how you get to market in the, uh, in the market um, and present your, um, your uh, um, values to your target audience. Okay, so that's a bit about us and what we do, and hopefully that deals with any questions um, in that area. But as I said, I will come back to the questions that have been asked in the, um, in the question box. Now, so far, we've talked about whichever style of CV you decide to go for. Now, don't get too hung up about that right now in terms of which style is best. All I wanted to get across really is that for out-and-out -out contractors, there's a really great way of going to market. For those people who are less sure, there's a what we'd call a more traditional way. Bear in mind, we write CVs for people who are in the contract market as well as the permanent market um, and interim and non-exec directors and all sorts. So um, a good CV, however it's structured, will work well in the marketplace and will work better than a bad CV. 
It's just that in there are certain circumstances where the structure of the CV can work even better because of the marketplace that you're in and the people that you're dealing with. But you'll have noticed that with the contract style CV, uh, where there's lots of case studies describing what you're capable of, you might then say, well, okay, how do you deal with the career chronological order of things um, and what you've actually been up to? And of course, you do need to address that. It just doesn't become the focus of the document. So I've suggested it's really beneficial if, because of what you've done, what you've what you're doing, any gaps that you've got, any changes in direction that you've had that on paper, if you're forced to go down the chronological order, make you look less impressive than you believe you are, or restrict your ability to communicate your strengths to your target audience, because the most recent thing you've done is not really representative of what you're about, um, or because of some change that you've had to make uh, to earn a living, but actually is taking you down the wrong path, or one a path that you want to reverse back up. Changing the style of the CV can be a really convenient way of maximizing your marketability. So it is, a, it is something that needs to be discussed and thought about. But we do still need to visit the career uh, chronology and what you've been doing in your, in your life. So I'll deal with that now. Um, and for the contract style CV, it's very simple, actually. Given that the bulk of page one is all about building the business case, so you, you've got the professional summary or executive summary, the key skills, the bullet points, um, then a little box saying current role is I'm a freelancer, I'm a contractor, I'm an interim manager, whatever you are, here are the people I've worked with, and here's now what follows, a list of um, projects or assignments that I've been involved with in my life. There's no particular order to them, they're not all listed, but it's a great sample of what I've been up to. We then list those typically eight case studies. So you're now well into page two of the CV. Um, and you're beginning to get to the point at which you're flipping over to the third page. You've still got to fit in some other bits and pieces. So you don't want to be spending a great deal of space explaining what the chronological, chronological order of things is. And so we keep it very brief. I'll show you an example in a minute, but it is as brief as the dates from and to, the client that you've worked with, the job title that you had on one line mentioning whether you were contracted or permanent, because some people have a mix, um, and uh, also mentioning whether you had any contract extensions or renewals, really important. A lot of people forget that, um, and when we start talking with them, they suddenly say, oh yeah, I, I had you know, nine renewals there, three here, one there, none there, two there. Really important message, if you've got a good track record of getting extensions or renewals, worth bringing up on the CV. So if we take a look at um, Matt CV again, um, and I will um, put that up on the screen. I'll just wait for that to be for you. So you should see there um, Matt CV. Um, as I said, we've got, uh, I'll just, just scroll down it. Um, introduction, business case, what? Matt's currently doing start of the project assignment portfolio on page one. Page two continues that with some more examples. And then you'll see just uh, bottom two thirds of, sorry, bottom third of page two, which most of you will be seeing on the screen now, um, an area marked career chronology. And that's where he's just listing the precise order of things for those that, for those people that are bothered by that sort of stuff, which you know you need to account for your time. People get suspicious if you don't account for the time, but it's quite a nifty way of um, delaying the point at which people see that. So it's really useful, as I said, for people who've got particular you know, either awkward gaps, gaps for reasons that they don't really want to go into detail about. Sometimes that could be quite personal reasons, and we've dealt with all sorts of situations for all sorts of people um, where you know, uh, you know, the gaps are there for, you know, for what they consider to be generally really strong, um, sometimes you know, very sad reasons, but they're there. Um, rather than going with a document to market where that's blatantly obvious and might cause them problems, this allows you to deal with the, the sort of the formal side of your career, but without leading with it. Yeah, in some people's um, cases, it's not their most marketable attribute. 
yeah, the most important thing is they have a particular skill. They've been able to demonstrate that skill, but maybe for the last six months, 12 months, they've been doing something completely different by choice or otherwise, um, and they need to uh, be able to present a different message. And the message is, here's the skill that I have, here's the proof to back it up. Oh, and by the way, this is where I've been accumulating those skills. So it's very clear, it's very concise, it's very brief, but deliberately so. The focus is case studies, evidence, proof, not what have I been up to precisely between these dates. That's not the lead focus. So if you think that could work for you, then that's great. That's a good way to go forward. For others, it may be more appropriate to get on a more traditional route. And we'll come back to that start of CV later as well, just to, as a reminder. Okay, so that's, that's quite important to you how how we deal with the chronological side of things. Um, it's important now. We, we're going to sort of talk a bit, a little bit about um, the tail end of the CV and recommendations, um, and indeed then linking that to LinkedIn, um, particularly for contractors. Um, it's really important that if you've got any testimonial evidence, so um, recommendations, testimonials, uh, again, terminology doesn't really matter, really important that you um, mention that on the document that you're going to market with because it's, um, it's a, it's a you know, really valuable attribute to be able to promote. Um, we uh, take a lot of information from either uh, emails, documents, um, stuff that candidates have collected themselves um, and uh, bridge that onto the CV if it's appropriate. Um, and by appropriate, I mean it's somebody substantiating the qualities and skills that you have who ideally has employed you for those rather than somebody who's worked alongside you as part of your peer group or somebody you just get on with, or worse still, um, for the purposes of the CV anyway, you know, you meet regularly on a social basis and they just quite like to sort of pat you on the back. Um, those kind of things are inappropriate. The appropriate stuff is, you know, a manager, a former boss, um, employer, somebody who's actually decided to hire you for qualities um, that you had to offer and then you demonstrated those qualities and left a good um, uh, situation, if you like. That, that's good stuff to mention on the, the CV. Um, increasingly, of course, recommendations come through LinkedIn um, and they're actually really useful. They you can just copy and paste them or a selection of them. Some people have got quite a lot of recommendations. It's not appropriate to put too many on the CV. It, it depends a little bit on how much space is being taken up by other things. But typically, I guess for most CVs that we're writing, two or three strong recommendations is appropriate and looks good and gets the point across. Far more effective than putting references available on request. I mean, it's wholly meaningless anyway. Um, people will seek references if they want them. What you say on your CV about whether they're available or not matters neither here nor there. So don't waste space mentioning things that actually don't lead anywhere. Um, focus on providing space for actual real recommendations and the ones that off link, come off LinkedIn are really good um, if they're appropriate of course again come from the right source they can be literally copy and pasted and put on the CV. Um, talking a bit about LinkedIn um, if I can't imagine any contractors who aren't on LinkedIn although I have come across a couple recently who were there didn't want to be on it for particularly personal reasons, but realistically, if you're out there looking for opportunities um, and you want a profile, um, you really ought to be on LinkedIn. I'll assume for the time being that the audience is on LinkedIn or has some presence. Um, you might have seen on one of the notes at the bottom of the screen just um, that uh, roughly uh, the vast majority, over 80% of people who are looking to employ contractors applies to, to permanent roles as well, but certainly just for contractors, um, will check you out on LinkedIn before making decisions about interviewing and appointing. Um, now, it gets a fuzzy area in terms of what people would what people would be put off by and, and what, what decisions would they make if they didn't like what they saw on LinkedIn, but there is enough evidence to suggest, of course, you've got a weak CV, as I said earlier on in the session, and uh, and you've just replicated that weak CV on LinkedIn. You're certainly not adding any value. 
um, and, and LinkedIn is incredibly important now in terms of being used as a tool by recruiters and employers. Um, more and more people are being selected through it throughout uh, in the absence of any other means. Uh, more and more shortlists are being drawn up as a consequence of it. Um, and um, more and more money being spent by recruiters and employers leveraging some of LinkedIn's advantages, which are broadly its large pile of people, a lot of which are passive, i.e. they're not actively looking to move, but if they were approached professionally, they might be interested in moving or compelled to consider an opportunity. So you need to have a well-written profile and to be visible on LinkedIn because it is a really good way of being visible and communicating your, your skills and abilities. Just a few pointers because it's, it's a big subject worthy of a whole webinar in its own right. Um, but the things tend to, people tend to get wrong. Um, if you're familiar with LinkedIn, underneath your name, immediately underneath your name on the profile, there's an area called the professional headline. What you don't really want that to be saying is anything akin to currently looking for work, desperately looking for work, looking for next contract, uh, or anything akin to that. Um, and you don't really want it just reflecting what you're currently doing um, for reasons that I mentioned earlier. If what you're currently doing isn't really what you want to be doing going forwards or as a backward step, um, yeah, for good reasons, because you needed to earn some money, but isn't really what the level you want to be at. Replicating that as the lead thing underneath your name is not a clever move. So what the professional headline ought to be is a pretty succinct summary. It has to be because there's a limit on the number of characters, um, and it's quite tight. Um, it's less than a tweet length. Um, you've got to be communicating, in effect, um, either an edited or a complete version of your value proposition. You know, what are you in the marketplace and what have you got to offer the world? Um, and so some descriptor, a bit like the opening sentence on one of our CVs, is a good place to start. For example, experienced project manager with expertise in such and such a sector. You know, something compelling that makes people think, hmm, okay, that's relevant, that's appropriate, not looking for next contract, because that doesn't really sell a great message. In an ideal world, your LinkedIn profile ought to be a hook. Somebody comes across it, they either stumble across it, good fortune for you, that you're searched for because of certain criteria, you become visible because of some kind of search performed on LinkedIn, you appear. What you want it to be is the tool, a bit like the CV, which encourages somebody to take some other action. Now, that could be they call you because you've put your number on there, they email you because you've made that visible, or they want to connect with you and link through LinkedIn because all the other shutters are down. But it, it, it really ought to be some kind of call to action. That's the ideal. Um, what you don't want it to be is a desperate plea because most people on LinkedIn aren't desperately looking for anything, or if they are, they're making it very, very um, clear that they've actually got skill sets. The good profiles are ones that make the skill set clear. And you're really wanting the recruiter or hirer to be thinking, I hope this person is available. I hope they'll be interested in what I have to say. That's the ideal situation. OK, um, the summary, which is the bit of text that appears normally top of the profile underneath the name bit and the professional headline and where you're based and the, the sector you're in. Um, again, you need that to be your your value proposition, what have you got to offer the world, what are the things that you're good at, um, not a rambling description of all the things that you've done in your life, um, or just a carbon copy of what you've got on your CV. Um, so it needs to be that bit that says, you know, this is what I am, this is what I'm good at, this is, what I, this is the return I can offer on your investment. So it's similar to the opening summary on a CV that we've written. And then as far as the positions are concerned, again, you don't want to be going into lots of detail. Um, it's, it's not good to have everything under the sun listed on LinkedIn because if somebody can look at the profile and find out everything about you, however much LinkedIn might like to have all that data on you stored away in its um, system, and it will encourage you to do that, of course, if you've played around with LinkedIn, it, it encourages you that you'll get a better profile better in speech marks the more information you put on it. That's not actually strictly true. Um, better profile is one that gets searched more effectively. You want to appear in people's searches more often than not for skills that you genuinely have. 
Now, that isn't about telling them where you went to secondary school or primary school or um, all the associations and memberships that you have necessarily. What it is about is good content and good keywords and will get picked up by people who are searching for those kind of keywords right now. And that's subtly different. And it's quite possible to have what LinkedIn would describe as being an average medium profile but actually appear a damn sight more often than other people with a so-called expert level of profile um, and if you know anything about LinkedIn you'll know that they have these different levels of profile and they will encourage you to achieve higher and higher levels by putting more and more content on and even just adding a photo or removing a photo will materially affect the level of profile LinkedIn will judge you on it actually doesn't necessarily make any difference to where you'll appear in somebody's search, which is the key thing. So on positions, don't 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 provide too much detail. Provide enough for people to know where you've been and what you've been doing. Again, it can help reinforce the chronological order of things or not, depending on how you structure the profile, uh, it, depending on whether that works to your advantage or not. But really, it's just brevity. It's just, this is a summary, um, enough to entice people to want to take further action. That's the ideal. Most people don't use the project section. Um, and if you're wondering what is the project section, then you have your answer. But it's a really nifty way of being able to demonstrate, like we do on our CVs, the case studies, career highlights of your life. Um, we port a lot of the information across from the CVs into this area because it's a really good way of saying, OK, um, I've told you a little bit about who I've worked with um, and when I've worked for them linked to those positions are a series of projects that I've been involved with which provide the evidence to support my abilities. That's where the detail needs to go in those projects are a great vehicle for doing that. You don't have to put everything but again a selection of things that you've done is a really good way of dealing with that. So um, that's a bit about LinkedIn. Again if you've got any more questions about that by all means ask but um, in effect, um, our advice there is, A, make sure you're on it, um, unless you have a very strong personal reason as to why you shouldn't be. Um, B, make sure the profile is well structured. There's some bits I haven't gone into this evening, like the skills and expertise section, which is the, um, the area that rather annoyingly some people will either endorse or be endorsed for having skills in certain areas and their little picture will appear alongside the skill that you've been, been endorsed for. Um, most people don't use anywhere near the maximum level of skills available. So it's, it's detail like that that absolutely critical to how you get noticed via LinkedIn and how you'll be searched and how you'll appear when somebody does a search. So um, you know, review all that and, and, and as part of your how do you market to your target audience, make sure the LinkedIn profile is sorted. But as I say, if you find that something that is... Uh, you just don't want to spend the time on it, you want professional help, then we can help you with that. Um, and as a final sort of um, wrap-up of this evening, um, one of the offers that we make to people during these webinars, which was quite a compelling offer, is that um, our standard prices for writing a CV with anybody, any, anybody more than seven years' experience, I should say, so there's anybody out there who's got less than seven years' work experience and they're interested in getting their CV done, then you need to call us because... Um, all the prices I quote for people with more than seven years work experience. But ordinarily, we charge 299 plus VAT for a CV, 50 quid plus VAT for a LinkedIn profile at the same time, and a cover letter, 30 quid plus VAT at least. Um, so you can do the maths, and you're looking at 379 um, plus VAT for those three things. This evening, and until close of play on Saturday, the 30th, so end of the month, we're doing those three things for 275 plus fat, um, so a substantial saving. And um, it's only available for people who've watched this webinar, and it is only available until Saturday close of business. Any orders after that, received after that, I'm afraid, go to standard rate card. Um, and for those people thinking about either format or CV, that the cost applies to either format. There's no difference in the price whichever format you choose. But as I say, some people do say, well, what about both formats? Can I have both? We say, of course you can. It's not 275 times 2. Um, typically, you're looking at, uh, it is hard to give an absolute precise um, price on uh, the second CV, but as we've spent most of the time gathering the data, you're looking at a, a fairly nominal charge of probably somewhere between 90 and 
hundred and something quid for a second CV on top of the core CV, just to give you an idea. But normally most people get away with one version, but if you did want both, we can accommodate that and we need to discuss that with you. There's also a pack available for those people that just want some more guidance and advice. I'm going to give you a link in a minute to um, A, that offer, but B, if you just wanted some templates, a workbook and an interview book uh, in terms of how to hand handle interviews and prepare yourself better, we've got a really good value pack. It's just 15 quid plus fat, which you can order via the website and the link I'm about to give you. Um, you can't actually type um, or click on that via your screen, but if you bear with me, what I'm going to do is just type in the uh, link that you can go visit the um, offer um, and you can keep this for future reference if you want into the chat room facility and then you can use that um, as you see fit. So uh, that's coming up now. And um, if you're interested in those services uh, or uh, just a discussion, either give us a call or email us at the email that you can see on the screen and um, we can deal with your requests or thoughts or questions on a one-to-one -one basis, give you a bit more advice and guidance. Um, but if you're ultimately interested in getting things moving, obviously we can get the process moving um, ASAP. So uh, that's it for this evening in terms of the formal presentation. I noticed some questions been asked, so I will uh, deal with those right now. Um, but just a quick reminder, if you're interested in the offer, make sure you order um, or contact us before, or if you need to speak with us before to end of play tomorrow, because it is a big discount. We don't ordinarily offer this kind of discount to, um, to people. So it's a webinar only offer, and it does close Saturday. You can pay electronically via the website using the link I've put through the chat room facility, um, or you can call us, but of course you need to call us by close of play tomorrow. For those that want to hang on and listen to the answers to the questions, I'm uh, more than happy to hang on. Um, I'll run for another um, five or ten minutes or so until I've got through the questions, depending on how many there are. For those that need to disappear, um, thank you very much for your attention this evening. I hope you found it useful. Um, and um, remember, acid test, two, two main things, acid test for your CV, you know the stats, keep an eye on it, and build a business case, strong business case for your interests not just have a list of things that you did and go to market with that list um, because it, it just doesn't work in today's marketplace. Now, in terms of the questions, um, just bear with me, I'll just flick onto that screen. Um, so we've got Hiran, um, if you're still on board, if a person has many in interdisciplinary skills and it would be better to put all the skills. Uh, um, not quite clear what you mean by that, but if um, it it depends. I think the best way of answering that, if I've got the positioning right there, Aaron, is that, yes, if you've got lots and lots of skills and they're disparate and they could apply to lots of different roles, yes, you need to be a bit careful. Um, uh, you've got to appear to be, as best possible, um, a specialist in today's market, by and large. So if you're appearing to be a sort of jack-of-all-trades, master of none, then it's not a good positioning with your CV. So if you've got lots of skills, they could apply to lots of different environments. Your CV needs to be as specific and as fine-tuned as possible um, within reason. So you need to, to parcel up those skills and go to market with the ones that are most appropriate. Um, Jim, um, I've been out of the engineering market for the last five years, did some property development for three two-year paternity break to help my wife go into twin girls. I want to resume my engineering career, finally on interviews. Do you have any tips for all employers red flag me for this career break? Right, okay, that's a really good question, Jim, and the answer is inevitably complicated, um, but by and large, with people that face this kind of situation, part of it is um, you're just going to have to accept that some people will judge you on that um, however you go to market. Um, so just accept that you'll not win all of the battles or as many as you might otherwise have done, which you probably have done already through experience. Part of it is, it, um, just on a, on a clarity point, um, the um, 
position. It depends what skills you've got. As long as the skills are relevant and the experience that you've had in engineering is strong and valid still and can't be aged necessarily. So by looking at it, nobody could obviously say, well, however you position that information, um, it's not relevant to the market now. So I'm assuming that there's still relevance to the experience. Um, not because I view five years as being a long period of time, but purely because I'm imagining that in IT, for example, if you'd said that um, you know, your experience was with uh, Windows 98, I mean, I can't think of anybody that uses Windows 98 these days, so that would be not a good skill to go to market with. Engineering, I'm assuming, is slightly different. You've still got relevant skills to the market. If you're interested in contracting, then the style of CV that I've spent those last few minutes talking about would be quite appropriate and could help you because in a way it's a way of getting across the message that you've got skills, they're relevant skills, you've practiced those skills, you can demonstrate where you've practiced those skills, that's the message you need to get across first, except that if people were to push the point of course then the reality is those skills were acquired a short while ago relatively speaking but if you can if you can reposition all the content on the CV in the way that I've described you'd stand a better chance and we know people who've really struggled because their experience that they want to sell is buried deep in their CV and they were they, they, they thought they had to go to market with that chronological style of CV um, my suggestion would be you don't have to go down that route. You can reposition that information. Um, you have to accept that some people will still obviously pick out the fact that maybe, yeah, the, the experience was gained a little while ago, but you can delay the inevitable. If your current CV, for example, sort of hits people between the eye with a, a story about not being involved in engineering and trying to explain that before you get on to the, the competencies that you have, you'll probably be losing people before they've had a chance to absorb what you're trying to tell them. So I, I think there's an answer there, Jim, potentially, um, just by repositioning the data, going to market with the strengths that you have, um, but inevitably I probably need to find out a little bit more and look at what you've been up to before giving you um, more detailed advice. Um, but that's the best way. So, to, so the second part of your comment, really, how, you know, tips to avoid employers red flagging you for the career break is don't give them the evidence or the opportunity to spot that as early as they might be doing. Except that they, it, you, know, you can't hide it, but you can represent and reposition the information, which may get you further up the process before they make a decision. Um, is I think the way you have to approach it. Uh, possibly a strong covering letter as well might be able to help there. If you're going direct to employers, that can make a difference through recruiters, arguably less so in fairness. Okay, I think that's it actually. So not that many questions at the end of it. Um, if anybody, I'm going to hang on for another few uh, seconds. So if anybody's got anything else they want to ask, please fire away. Um, and um, in the meantime, I'll um, get ready to shut this down. And um, I'll just also replace that uh, link in case anybody's still interested in that. Make sure people have got that on their screen. Um, and once again, for those that hang on, uh, thank you for your time. Um, tomorrow morning, you'll get an email with a link to the slides and the recording of the webinar uh, for those that want to read this call. If anybody wants to see anything again before I sign off, then um, by all means, let me know before I shut this thing down. And um, otherwise, I, I wish you good night, and you're more than welcome to sign off and enjoy the rest of your evening. And thanks again for your time.